welcome to Diplomatic License right here on City TV. My name is Apioko. Now today, my guest is very interesting and I will be introducing her to you shortly. But she is from Guyana and I'm excited about this because growing up wherever I would go in the world, and I mentioned that I'm from Ghana, people would say, do you mean Guyana? And I would say, no, I mean the West African country, not the Caribbean country. It was great to speak to a sister from the sister country, Guyana. Now, if you know anything about the Brazil house in Accra in Jamestown, or you don't, I'll tell you anyway, that the Tabon people, um, and of course, historically, we know that they were led by one knee, Azuma Nelson. They came from the shores of Brazil. They're freed slaves, descendants of slaves as well. Now they came and they established themselves here in Jamestown and built the Brazil house. So Afro-Brazilian culture, Afro culture, Afro-Caribbean culture, all those things are speaking to us through the Brazil house. And we will start our conversation with a woman who is Afro-Caribbean herself from this space. So once again, this is Diplomatic License. My name is Apioko. Let's get right to it. Welcome back and it's still diplomatic license time and it's time for us to get into our conversation with my guest. If you're just joining us, I said that she's very special. All my guests are, but she's especially special because she's from Guyana. And throughout my life, wherever I've been to several places I mentioned earlier, whenever I say I'm from Ghana, people say, oh, do you mean Guyana? And I'll say no. So it's great to have this Ghana-Guyana connection. But Jennifer Branch, who is my guest for today, is a big woman, as we say in city and in Ghana. She is a senior legal officer at the UN headquarters in New York. And what makes this all the more special is that we caught her on the very last day of her visit to Ghana. She's literally out going back to work, going to do what she does best, just making women, black women, women of African descent look good at their job. Okay, so hi, hi Jen. Hi, hi so how are you? Hello, oh, well, how are you? Well, I don't know what to say. I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't know if, if we blush, but uh, you really, you really made you really gave me a massive big up there, as, as no, we would I say in the to. Caribbean. I have um, to. Oh, yeah, well, thank you very much yeah. for your very kind and warm welcome to Ghana. I'm so happy and privileged to be here with you and your team. It's a real pleasure for me being in Ghana, and uh, I guess the icing on the cake is getting to meet you all Absolutely. today. And coming here to um, Brazil House, I didn't know, I, I've you know, learned quite a bit about Ghana in my growing up and through my life, but I hadn't realized, I must confess my ignorance until I got here, that there was a Brazil house. Mm. So that makes me feel right at home. <laughs> As you know, Guyana is Brazil's, one of Brazil's northern neighbors. Absolutely. So it just makes it feel so cozy, you know, yeah. the human family all around the world. And uh, I, I thank you so much. And I want to say that you do look like a Guyanese. Oh, I we're, do. Yes, we're I all family. <laughs> you could be Guyanese. We are multicultural, multi-ethnic in Guyana. So you could be my sister from Guyana. Absolutely. And I have the reverse of what you get because when I introduce myself as being from Guyana, a national of Guyana, it's not unusual that people will say, oh, you mean Ghana? <laughs> and then I have to say, well, yes, I accept Ghana. It's I claim just it. that I came via Guyana, <laughs> having left Ghana so many centuries ago, or having been transported from Ghana so many centuries ago. So, you know, we are family. That's and a I'm happy to be statement. here. That's a powerful statement that you just said that you accept Ghana. It's just like you came through Guyana, coming from Ghana centuries ago. Yep. One big happy family. Yes, our ancestors right. were taken away and they took their genius to the so called New World. And so here we are, Absolutely. making, I guess, the loop. Absolutely. Now, Jennifer, one of the reasons, and you pointed it out when, when you just spoke that we came to Brazil House was because we do know that Brazil is a northern neighbor, or Guyana is a northern neighbor of, of Brazil. But I know that the Brazilian experience is extremely different from the Guyanese experience. And so I want you to take us back a little. What was it like growing up in Guyana, um, being Afro-Caribbean, and knowing that, I, I keep saying that as black people, as people of African descent, even for those of us who know for sure what our lineage, what our roots, what our heritage is, we can't do anything without carrying that, that weight around. 
So I can imagine what it was like for you, knowing that your ancestors were forcefully taken away, treated terribly, having to live with that knowledge of, 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 your, of your, your, your distant past. But what was it like growing up in, in Guyana? Well, that's a profound question. There are simple answers and deeper answers. Growing up in Guyana was a lot of fun. <laughs> that's what I can say about my childhood. I can imagine. Good old days, and I just wish every child in the world could think of their you know, formative years as the good old days. Because as I mentioned, I'm from a multicultural society. We have, first of all, our uh, indigenous uh, Indians who were there in Guyana before anybody got there. And they named Guyana. They were called, right? yes, yeah. Guyana is, is it's taken from their mm -hmm. language. Guyana means land of many waters. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about that a little bit more, mm -hmm. but I don't want to digress too much right. because I want to stay with the question. So we have our Amerindian brothers and sisters of whom there are four main groups and many subgroups. Mm -hmm. So they have names like, or their nations or kingdoms have names like uh, Carib, that's a very popular one, from which we get Caribbean. Many people say Caribbean, but it's really Caribbean, Caribbean. from the original owners and inhabitants of that region of the world. We also have Caribs, we have Arawaks, and we have other groups, Waraus, Wapishana, Waiwai, Patamona, many, many Makushi, <laughs> many others. Beautiful names. Right, beautiful names, beautiful people from the Amazon rainforest. So they were the original inhabitants, then Europeans came. As you know, Europeans transported our mutual ancestors, yours and mine, and that was a period in history that is much written about and for, for good reason. And following the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade, the enslavement of our mutual ancestors, then other groups of uh, other nationalities were brought to replace the labor that we had provided mm. on the plantation or that we had been forced to the provide. The work had to, it had to continue. The, of course, mm. King Sugar had to be satisfied mm. uh, because our ancestors were heavily involved in the cultivation of crops. They did many other things, um, you know, which we can talk about later as well. They actually were the backbone of the, you know, the modern Americas, North, Central, and South, as we know it. Um, not that it wasn't there and it wasn't developed after a fashion, but the the modern making yeah. of the, the Americas, exactly. Of it. Our ancestors were, um, you know, contributed. They were key players, and that's why they were taken from here to provide labor in many different ways. So that's the part of history um, that you've adverted to. But growing up as a child, I mean, I knew something about that. Um, <laughs> I knew that we were multicultural because we had all these other groups that came. We have Indo-Guyanese who came from India, East Indians, we call them in Guyana. We have many different groups or the culture of many different groups of Europeans. Uh, we have Chinese, you know. Uh, so going to school with that rainbow of humanity was a lot of fun because it also, of course, influenced our cuisine, which is very multicultural and every child loves to eat, I think. So it was a lot of fun and the festivals because we had not only what is called the African culture or cuisine uh, came to be called Creole. So we Creole. have the Creole cooking. Okay, so we so have, when we talk of Creole food, mm, no, Creole soul food, that's exactly, what we're talking that's about. Exactly, that's the African part of the mm. culture and I think um, we'll chat a little bit more about that. Okay. And uh, we also have the East Indian cuisine, we have the Amerindian cuisine, the European, the Chinese. So it's all mixed there. And when you have an event at school or a wedding or anything, then we can have all of that food to consume. And uh, so it, that was a lot of fun That's, too. That sounds like heaven on earth. It was. <laughs> and then we also have the festivals. So we have certain um, festivals such as Emancipation that we all celebrate the 1st of August. That's the day when there was the proclamation of Emancipation. And as my grandmother would say, my late grandmother Constance would say, that was when we had great jollification. <laughs> a lot of dancing and partying. So there was a lot of dancing and partying secretly, even when they weren't really allowed to be doing it for those hundreds of years when they were expected to just support you know, foreign economies so, and so, foreign ways so, of life. So the 1st of August in Guyana is celebrated as Emancipation Day. Yes. And this was the day when 
enslaved people of, of African descent or otherwise were now more or less freed, allowed to, to live as free people. Yes. And it's something you celebrate every year. Yes, it's throughout that what's called amazing. CARICOM, the Caribbean community, that's mainly the English-speaking Caribbean, but also we have some other, um, you know, uh, some other member states of CARICOM, like Haiti. And so we celebrate, um, you know, emancipation because that was the time when we moved from being legally chattel or property just like a chair or a cow on the plantation and when we were allowed to be legally recorded as human beings so we celebrate that um, and then we have other festivals other celebrations national celebrations like our, our Republic Day okay. which is like a big carnival it's called Mashromani Mashromani yeah mash you got it Mashromani yeah. that's that's um, a term that is said to be coined from our reflecting the heritage of our Amerindian brothers and sisters and then we have certain other festivals such as Diwali so, so just like there is in India, there's yes, Diwali. Yes, we Ghana. have Diwali. I did not know that. Yes, oh. yes we, we have Diwali in Guyana, Diwali celebrations and everyone so you know, is it, joins is it in the festivities. So is it pretty much the same as the Indian Diwali where, you know, there, there's lights, there's lots of color, pretty much the Festival same. Festival of lights, mm. yes. And when I was a child, we would go around, we might have dias ourselves with the lights. And, uh, you know, you use vegetable oil and, yeah, so we might have those. And we would go around to see the best lighting displays in our neighborhood. Wow. And then uh, we also have uh, what's called pagua. I believe it's better known in many places as holy. Holy. Yes, the colors and so on. I enjoyed that as a child as well because we took powder to school and sometimes you got powdered. Yeah. Uh, Lots of colored powder. powder. Yes. So for anyone who's, I mean, if you don't know what that is, when you see a lot of um, Indian festivals, you see all this colored powder, yes, really yes, yes. bright, and it's splashed all over the place. And yeah. I enjoy that. I think most <laughs> children would, and the water, dousing each other with water. <laughs> that was great fun. So it's, it's a lot of different festivals. Our Chinese brothers and sisters had their festivals as well, and as I mentioned, their cuisine. So when friends of that persuasion invited you home or brought something for a school event or a work event, it was a quite a diverse uh, feast. I mean, I'm already seeing and hearing things that connect your experience in Guyana to Ghana. Um, maybe not as, in terms of um, culture, as global, in terms of the experience, we have lots of different ethnic groups in Ghana. And each ethnic group, I'm sure you've discovered. I've noticed. Here. Yes. My sister's neighbors, right. my sister lives yeah. here. Lots, lots of different ethnic groups. But we have our festivals too. <clears throat> um, I'm Ghana, Homawa is a big one. And then we have the Pekule food. It's, they're all very colorful, very vibrant, very loud. So I'm seeing those connections. But something else that you said stood out for me in terms of our similarities. You spoke about your grandmother. Yeah. And for those of us who live on the continent and the, the motherland, Ghana, yes, but other African countries as well, having your grandparents, or older people within your extended family be a part of your life is a huge, huge, huge deal. What was it like growing up with your grandmother and having access to her? Well, it was just wonderful. I, I only got to know one of my grandmothers because my dad was orphaned at an early age. But she, her, you know, she was a little woman, not that much bigger than I. Yeah, and um, but she had a tremendous dynamism about her. Very independent, very wise, and uh, I think of her often throughout my life. We we lost her a couple decades ago, but I think of her often. And uh, in speaking about the food. I'd have to tell you that my grandmother... So I just want us to walk a little, so... Sorry to have interrupted, but your grandmother. So you mentioned that you lost her about two decades ago. Um, but what impact did, did she have on your life? A tremendous one. She was a, a little lady, not that much bigger than I, but tremendously <laughs> dynamic, you know? Very independent, very wise. And I wish she could be alive today to see all the changes that are taking place because she never had a chance to visit the continent. And I wish she could have been here and I just 
uh, hope and pray and sometimes sense that she's with me in my travels and she can experience it through me. What, was we, it something that she really wanted to do? Come, uh, come, come and I visit. I believe she yeah, would have loved it, and she raised us with great independence. She had a she had a great influence on my life. She lived uh, walking distance, about a mile and a half, if you wanted to really go for a walk, uh, you could get there walking. And we talked about the food. She was an entrepreneur, a caterer. So I learned a lot of secrets from her. And I learned to make some things that I understand came from here. Like, well, I'm, I'm curious to know, like things like what? Well, she taught me to make something that we called in Guyana, conky. Conky. And I understand that conky has a relative here, or a parent here, so <laughs> to speak. Maybe you can tell me some more about it. Uh, Konki, Kenke? Kenke, yes, yes. I, we're actually in one of the homes of Kenke. We were really? in Jamestown. I mean, Kenke, especially Ga Kenke. Um, or we You're say Ga Kami. Right? Yes, I am. You know, we're, we're, we're in the home of it. So that's interesting. Wow. But, so how is Konki made? Maybe if I, if I know how it's made, how your grandmother taught you, then I'll be able to explain to you how we make ink and then we can we can draw the similarity more clearly. So well, the way I made the conky or the way that we made it in Guyana, I'm not sure how popular it is because we have other influences oh. now, faster dishes, <laughs> but uh, if you know what I mean. But uh, the conky, it was made from what we called cornmeal, uh, derived from, from maize, basically okay. dried maize. And uh, it was the one that we have was a, a dessert, okay. whereas I understand that Kenke here is a, main a savory dish. dish. Yes. Ours was more of a sweet dish. You could make it with, or it was made with lots of spices, cinnamon, okay. cloves, etc. It could have dried fruit, um, pumpkin, shredded pumpkin, or grated pumpkin, and then it was all mixed together, and it was flat, I guess about maybe like five inches long and, and about this wide, flat. You wrapped it in banana, we wrapped it in banana uh, leaves, banana peel, and then it was tied with actually the, the string from, from that, um, that, you know, crop and steam. And when it was done, you ate it. It was pretty delicious, so I learned to make that as a child. And my grandmother, as I said, was instrumental in teaching me lots of things. I wasn't that appreciative of soup, but Sunday soup, Soup was the big thing on Sunday, and she made fufu. She had a mortar. So I how, hear, so how I hear do you, you make fufu? Uh, fufu machines. Yes, we didn't we have do those. Now, but I mean, but most people still use the mortars unless yeah. you're you're running a, a proper chop bar or some kind of big catering firm. Mm -hmm. I mean, the mortar and the pistol is the way to go. <laughs> but but what? So what <laughs> ingredients do you use for the fufu? They made it with um, plantains. I, I'm not sure if people still make it. Unfortunately, a lot of the the food culture mm -hmm. has changed a lot. I think I've seen that in my lifetime. Things that were preserved that the ancestors brought from here centuries ago. And I think uh, my generation has not done such a good job of maintaining that some aspects of, of, of the food culture. So that means that fufu, I, I mean, we know, we know that it's traditional. We know that it's something that's been with us for a long time. Yeah. But it means it existed long, probably for longer before than we thought. Yes. Because if it made it all the way across hundreds, the Atlantic. Hundreds of years yeah. ago. Yeah. Wow. So it's plantain and then just pound it. Yes, pound it, pound it, and then they made it into the little the round balls. mounds and then that would go into the soup. So a rich so split like, pea soup. So it's just like what we have here. Yes. What, what kinds of soup? Um, I think mainly split peas, but it could be other types of, of you know, beans and lentils. Okay. But uh, So I'm guessing that when, when, when the ancestors the ancestors got there, they had to find ways of improvising, mm -hmm. you know, because yes. I mean, we typically wouldn't have split peas in our soup. We'd do a light soup or mm. a palm nut soup. Very, I don't know if you've had any of the soups um, while you've been in no, Ghana. No, but yet. my brother-in-law is yeah. very fond of soups, I know. <laughs> yeah, soups are a yeah. big thing. The groundnut soup or peanut soup, depending yeah. on how. You know, I've had peanuts. Some, yeah. Yeah. And the stewed peanut as yes. well with, with meat and so yeah. on. So lots of all those things. So that's an interesting connection. But back to Konki. So it is very similar to Kinke, but we also have sweeter versions. Um, we've got something called abolo, for example. Oh. It can either be steamed or baked. Um, a lot of the, the evers are fancy eat it, but guys like it too. We have something called kaffa. I remember when I was, I was much younger and we traveled to the Volta region. It's like a yeah. sweet king cake. It has sugar in it. The fanties eat it as well. It's also wrapped in, yes, wrapped in plantain leaves ah. and boiled. So 
they're all variations of, of the K and K kind of thing, you know. And the sweet one. Yes. Remind me of the name, please. There's kaffa. There's um, th um, there's abolo as well. Oh. You know, lots of so it's That's probably the one we yeah. have. And it's and it, that, the abolo is flat as well. Yes. Which that's, is why that's it, it comes to mind. The fenty. You know? Yeah. And the evers have it too. That is very interesting. Yeah. Very. So so again, I'm thinking that as time progressed. Uh, that the ancestors found ways of preserving the culture by improvising with things yes. that they couldn't find readily. Whatever they could, because we also have something called cook-up rice. That's a very important, one of the main Creole dishes. And, and um, it's, I guess, a variation of yeah, jollof rice. Jollof, yeah, and we rice. have that some form of seasoned rice. Every Caricom nation has its own version of, yeah. of seasoned rice. Yeah. So we are not alone. Ours is made with a very rich coconut cream. It can be made with any bean, dried bean or lentil. Um, and it's called actually cook up rice because whatever they could find our ancestors put in there because although they were the engines of growth when they were enslaved, they did not have a ready supply of nutrition. So whatever they could grow in their spare time, whatever scraps they could put together, that's, they, they made a one pot dish. One. Yeah. And that stayed with us and it's become more dignified. We have all sorts of Gourmet things. versions, I'm right. sure. Right, <laughs> but in, in the old days, maybe pig's tail, whatever they could find, some shrimp, some dried fish, everything went in there. Some spinach, well, you can call it spinach because that's the internationally, um, yeah. I guess the closest thing internationally that, that you can find for uh, what we call Edo leaves. Mm. Uh, okay, yeah, so, Edos and yeah. dashin leaves, it's root crops like what you grow here as well. So similar yams to our so kontomri, because we've got kokiam yes. leaves. Yes, yeah, I so. think so. Ah, interesting. Okay, there's a car coming. This is the reality of diplomatic license. <laughs> we're, we're, we're in Jamestown, we're literally in the heart of Jamestown on the street. Yeah. But, so I, I'm just curious, so the um, mm -hmm. cook-up rice, uh -huh. right, is it similar to Jamaican rice and peas? Well, in a sense, in that there's rice and you have a dried lentil, bean or lentil, but ours can take on, I think there's, is a kind of a pure for, uh, form because um, they use the kidney bean and rice and I think it's a side dish, whereas ours is the, the dish. The it's a dish. one dish when, when, dish. when yes, in yeah. the way we because prepared Because we've got wache as well in Ghana. I don't know if you've had wache, but also um, the kidney beans or black-eyed beans or red beans or some kind of, of, of bean. Um, and then we, we cook it with rice. It has a certain color. We use natural dried leaves that give it like a reddish brownish color, eat it with lots of shito and oh, stew and shito. meat. Yeah, and it looks, in terms of look and feel, it actually looks like like the Jamaican rice and peas, oh. but it doesn't have the, the coconut sweet yeah. tang to it. And yes. it is a main dish as well. Yeah, so. ours has the coconut, yeah. so maybe ours is closer because it's a main dish. It has the coconut cream, so ours is a combination of the Jamaican and, and the Ghanaian, I guess. Brilliant. But, Brilliant. but you know that our ancestors were moved around a lot. Absolutely. They were chattel. They were transported as live cargo. Cargo, just like a chair or, you know, um, rum or anything. But they were live cargo because they could breathe and they could be flogged to work. So that's how they were transported. And then they were uh, recorded, sold on auction block, taken off as chattel on the plantations. And they had to figure out how to survive, how to try to preserve their culture to the extent they could, very secretly. Uh, and uh, they were moved around a lot. The chattel were moved around. So there are lots of books that document that, or maybe not as many as there ought to be, but there are books that document uh, and records that document the movement. So I think that's probably how a lot of the culture spread as well. Um, and so though, as you adverted to it earlier, going from Guyana, which is in South America, uh, along the northern coast of South America, nestled between Suriname on the east and Venezuela, which is to our west, and we are north of Brazil, yet you would have observed that I'm not really Afro-Latina. Yeah, no. I am, I yeah. am geographically South American, <laughs> but I am 
culturally Caribbean. Yeah, absolutely. So we have many identifiers in the modern world, so many identifiers. It's, it's, it's amazing. afro guyanese you know, Afro-Caribbean, South American geographically, a whole lot of identifiers. And I guess we just simplify it now. I'm a black woman. You're a black because woman. otherwise, You're it's so many woman. identifiers. You're a black woman. Or a yeah. woman of African descent. You know? That's it. That's it. And that will be consistent with a lot of resolutions Definitely. of the United Nations. Definitely. You know, and, and, and I'm yeah. sure we'll be talking a lot about that, surely, because you work in the thick of it. How, right. how ironic is that? that well, that's you know. true. But we need to go on a break now. And my okay. guest today is Jennifer Brand. She is a senior legal officer at the United Nations headquarters in New York. And she's in Ghana. We've just caught her on her very last day. So it's a very special time we're having here. She's Guyanese, my Guyanese sister, Ghanaian sister. Got this vibe going on. And currently we're in the heart of Jamestown in Accra, Ghana. Um, we started our walk from the Brazil house and we've, we're still in the Brazil loop here in, in old Accra. Now when we return, we continue our conversations because as you realize, a childhood in a place like Guyana that has such rich heritage is not just a childhood, it's a history lesson. We'll be right back. diplomatic license right here on City TV. My name is Apioko and if you're just joining us, I must have you know that my guest for today is Jennifer Brand. She is a senior legal officer at the UN headquarters in New York and she's visiting Ghana just about wrapping up her visit but we managed to catch her and we're having a wonderful conversation about what it was like growing up in Guyana. So now let's, let's, let's get back to that, Jennifer. We've spoken a lot about your grandmother and the things you learned from her, the, 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 the fufu and, <laughs> you know, the cook-up rice, all those things that are clearly um, things that were brought to Guyana from, from, from Ghana or Nigeria or other parts of, of the world, you know, during the slave trade, right? But let, let's, let's, let's talk about your family. So were you an only child? Did you have siblings? What was it like? Not an only child at all, many siblings. I'm the middle child of five. I have an older brother and sister and two younger brothers. So it was quite a busy household. Yeah. Yeah. And which part of Guyana did you grow up in? Well, I grew up in a part of Guyana that is called, we have three counties, I should say. One is Essequibo, okay. that's the westernmost county. I'm from the middle county called Demerara, Demerara. and then there's Burbese. Bobis is where our yeah. mutual ancestor Kofi yeah. launched the revolt in 1763. But my county, Demerara, is also famous because you might have heard, I'm sure Demerara you've heard of Demerara sugar. sugar. Brown sugar. Exactly. So <laughs> that's where the technology for the brown sugar was refined and that's where it gets its name from. Unfortunately... Did you know that, that Demerara sugar? So what, the next right. time you eat or bake with or use brown sugar, Demerara brown sugar to be precise, that's where it's coming from, Guyana. The, the technology, the name comes from Guyana. Wonderful. Yes, Demerara sugar. We have Demerara in the flesh. Yes, <laughs> ma'am. I'm a Demerara lady. And I guess now we're talking about counties and locations. I'm from the greater Georgetown area okay. near the capital, uh, the suburbs of Georgetown. And uh, I guess you can call me a Georgetown girl. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard of Eddie Grant. Yes. Georgetown girl. girl. Yes. I'm, I'm, I was a Georgetown girl growing up. So there you have it. But there's something really special that I'm very, 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 very proud of. That I was raised in what's called a free village. 
This is not to say that we have villages that are not free, but it's a term that was given to the type of village that I came from, one of our earliest villages, because my ancestors, as we've covered and as one can imagine based on my nationality as a person of African descent, being Guyanese. So when our ancestors were emancipated, when they were finally legally recognized as human beings in 18, 34, with apprenticeship that lasted four years until 1838, then they were no longer obligated to stay on the plantations. Plantation life had been what the colony was all about, apart from the rainforests where uh, our indigenous or Amerindian brethren, compatriots live. So what would they do? They didn't want to remain on the plantations where they had been enslaved. They wanted that's, to... That's basically living your enslavement, Exactly. Right? They wanted, even those who were Creoles, called Creoles because they were descended from people who had been transported and they were actually, um, you know, born in the colonies. They did not want to remain on the plantations. They wanted to taste freedom, to assert their right to self-determination. And so they established free villages and so my ancestral home, because I don't know where exactly my ancestors came from in the motherland, my ancestral home where I was raised is called Agricola in Guyanese pronunciation, but it's from you know, the Romance languages, Agricola. Okay. So it has something Agricola. to do still with the farming, with the agriculture that they've been mostly engaged in, and that's where We'll tell you, you so know, like I can the, tell you so more like about that. So like the cola nuts? Uh, kind of not really, but the sugar cane and lots of other agricultural products. Rice, we are a major producer of rice. and uh, But the sugar cane was mainly, king sugar it was called, was mainly what our ancestors were transported to be engaged in producing. So my ancestral village, my great-grandfather actually, he was not originally from what was then British Guyana at the time of emancipation, but he was from Barbados. Many people okay. from the Caribbean islands left their island homes to go out to the larger territories, larger colonies, mainly British Guyana, but also some of the larger islands to seek their fortune because a place like Barbados is quite a small uh, you know, land area compared with Guyana. We have islands in our major, one of our major rivers that have larger islands or, or rivers, I should say. We have rivers that have islands that are as large as or larger than some of our CARICOM neighbors. So there was a lot of land, not boasting, but there was a lot of arable land that people could cultivate. And there were lots of things going on after the emancipation, because Guyana being the only and most recent, certainly there in, in the CARICOM region, most recent acquisition of the British, the only South American territory of the British, it was quite advanced at that stage. The first railway was laid by the British, first South American railroad was laid in Guyana. So I'm quite curious about what my great-grandfather Joseph Branch about what he did. I've not been able to find out. I It's my goal to continue looking into it, to find out. I'd love to find out more about him. I carry his name. I was raised on one of the plots of land that he purchased for his children. And uh, I'm not sure whether he was a cooper on the estate, uh, probably a skilled person, because he you know, was able to establish himself quite nicely in Guyana. There was also gold mining, diamond mining, Lots of uh, you know revenue earning activities that a free man, a free man, so to speak, could engage in. So my great grandfather set sail, left his homeland of, of Barbados, went to Guyana, and established himself there. And it, there it, you have it, my so, free village story. It, it's so fascinating. And I did say at the beginning of the show, um, if you, you're tuning in now, you're late. As I always say, you're late. But 
Um, it, it's fascinating because I started by saying that when you're a person of African descent, you're a black person, you can't tell your story without knowing that there's a heritage to it. And you've just defined that. So you're from Demerara, which you say is the, the middle um, county. county, the middle county in Guyana. And, and the name where, where Demerara brown sugar, Demerara sugar gets its name from, right? But you grew up in a free village, Agricola, okay? Um, and there's a lot of beautiful history that you just told us there. Was this something that you were aware of even when you were very young? Well, I think so. I mean, I'm, I'm more acutely aware of it now. I knew that it was, Agricola was a home that had been purchased. I, you know, as I grew older, I understood that it had been established by our ancestors. And as I grew older, I learned a lot more about it. And I became very proud to think that people who had not tasted freedom in some cases, who had been kidnapped because there were, it was established the four leaders who decided to establish that village. One of them had actually been kidnapped from modern day Nigeria. He was called Figaro on the plantation. Figaro. And as a free man, he established himself under the name of David John. And his descendants still live in that village. I went to school with some of them. So it makes me so proud to think that they were not free, they were treated as chattel, and yet they had this vision to establish a free village. And because they had not been used to governing themselves in the colony of British Guyana, they were a little bit at a loss as to how to then, you know, establish themselves because the system of government did not recognize them. As human there was beings, no place, as citizens. Yeah, there was no place for them in the parliament to represent themselves. And so they got together and they could not reinvent the old system which had worked so well in the motherland. They all came from different parts of, of Africa, of course, of West Africa, certainly. And they set up a system of governance, system of government with village councils. And they had leaders and they had meetings and they developed a system for taxation, everyone contributing, a communal system, so to speak. And that worked actually, I came and found that because when I was a girl, I remembered the village council and they would be a council leader. They had elections, they looked after drainage, they looked after mosquito vector control, you know, mosquitoes, um, etc. They looked after cutting the parapets. It was well organized and I couldn't fully appreciate. I just assumed that it was centrally That's it driven. Is. That's what and it, it is. was when I got older that my mom, who thank God is still alive, some years ago, within the past decade, she said, you know, I'm getting on. I'm an educator. I'm a historian. I should document this history. And she began interviewing the elders and looking at records of our village. And uh, she decided to document it. She wanted a, a booklet or a pamphlet for future generations. And I said, mom, this is really serious history. This has not, our story has not been documented. We need to do it. And so I helped herself publish a limited number of copies. I'll show you. I brought a copy of the book Please, to show I, you. I, I need to see it. Right. And so we documented it. And I did some research. I, I helped her with it because she's not, she's not very friendly with computers. And so I, I looked at old records, including the British Gazette, looked at the owner of the plantation, because our village was purchased on the southern border of what was called Plantation Room. And so my worthy ancestors, yours as well, they decided to call their village Agricola, pronounced in Guyanese Agricola. And some of them seem to have been allowed or they found a way to be literate. And they had read about Rome and they felt, well, we conquered this thing called slavery. We have our freedom. And so they wanted to name the villages after great Roman conquerors. So I was raised in Titus Street. Wow. And there's Brutus Street, Remus, Romulus, Cato. Uh, yeah, those are the streets. That so they were free and they asserted their freedom and developed quite a good village. And there are other free villages. Mine is not the only one. Some of my school friends who came from free villages like Buxton, uh, you know, Queenstown, in another colony, Essequibo, 
they probably would not be so happy if I didn't mention at least some of the other free villages. And these villages, I became so proud as, as an adult because these are the blueprint of modern day Guyana. We didn't have towns. All we had prior to those free villages, you know, were the settlements, the communities of our indigenous uh, Amerindian ancestors and the plantation life. And then there you had it, free villages, so that when other ethnic groups, when Indo-Guyanese, Chinese, Madeirans, uh, you know, Portuguese, when they came, they could partake of our villages later on after the end of their respective periods of indentureship, or they could set up their own villages. But the blueprint came from our mutual ancestors, yours and mine. Yours. And I have a little story to tell you. I was enlightened when I went to Senegal some years ago, I'd always wanted to go to Gori, not because I necessarily believe that I have ancestors who came from that part of the continent, but I, I'm bilingual and I had heard about Gori and I'd seen a lot of very interesting footage. So when I got to Dakar, nice hotel, speaking with the manager, and I said uh, in my best uh, version of Parisian French, I let her know that I had a mission. I wanted to go to Gore to see where my ancestors had been stolen from. And she said to me very kindly, she said, Vous voulez dire nos ancêtres? And she had a nice smile. And, and then I thought about it. Yes, you mean to say our ancestors? ancestors. Yeah. She very gently and yeah. kindly corrected yeah. me. And after that day, I have always tried to say our ancestors yeah. when speaking with a brother or a sister, anyone from the motherland, because we are all, you know, from the same gene pool, the same region. We got mixed up. We don't know, you know, when people were transported, maybe separate ships, docking at different ports yeah. in the Americas, a mother going to Brazil. I, I actually saw that some of our ancestors were taken to Guyana, to my part of the world. Um, and some were taken to Brazil from Dakar. So people were taken, families were split, split up. And yeah, families were split up and we don't know who was taken where. And also the more important part of it or equally important part of it is that as our kind sister from Dakar told me, we lost people too. Those ancestors from whom I am directly descended are also the lost, kidnapped, and trafficked ancestors of you, you know, of her, of all of the brothers and sisters who remain on the, the continent. continent. So they are our ancestors. And if we think of one human family, then they are the ancestors of all members of the human family. Absolutely. I'm thinking of, of a quotation uh, from Dr. King, the Reverend Dr. Uh, Martin, Martin Luther King, where he spoke, and I can't remember the precise words now, so I will paraphrase, but he spoke about us all being tied in a single garment of destiny. When he spoke of injustice, anywhere being a threat to justice everywhere. And he spoke of that being tied together in a single garment of destiny. So we're all one human family, and that's the way I believe it was. History tells us it was that way before the social construct of racism, which as we know that, that racism was constructed to justify a certain economic system which required a very robust labor force. And so human beings became classified or categorized according to their futurization and their origin. But we are really one human race. Absolutely. And so Absolutely. they are our ancestors, so we're all... We're all one. We're all one. I mean, Jennifer, you've spoken like the true daughter of a historian. I mean, and you mentioned that your mother was, was a historian, and a little while ago, we are standing in front of the James Fort here in Accra, Greater Accra, which is a UNESCO, and I'm sure, you, you know, if you're watching, um, those of you who are watching, you can see the footage on the screen now, you know, 
It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site and it was established as such in 1979. And James Ford was one of the forts that was put up to transport slaves across the, the Atlantic. It also has a lot of significance because it was one of the places that Carmen Kumar was imprisoned. Really? Yes, it was. So we're, we're standing on history and I, I want to find out from you, you've, you've mentioned how at some point more recently in your life you helped your mother document a lot of the history that she experienced and probably at that time didn't even realize she had the power to document because no one else did or very few other people did. But what was it like growing up with a mother as a, as a historian? Because clearly you, you spit history, you live it, you speak well, it, you breathe you. it. I think of myself as a, you know, a history student, a lifelong history student. I think it was a real blessing to have a mother who was a historian because my siblings and I had a very early pretty natural understanding of our place in the world, of what we had inherited. And now that I'm an adult, I, you know, have had a certain life experience, that has allowed me, that understanding of history has allowed me to understand, you know, racism and to become, I guess, a racial justice champion, a human rights advocate, and more important than that, to have a great reverence and appreciation for and gratitude toward our mutual ancestors because they survived and they thrived and that's how come we are here not just alive but free because had they not resisted that abominable and barbaric system the transatlantic slave trade they always resisted. And there was passive resistance, as well as call to arms, freedom fighters, women as well as men. Absolutely. Queen Nanny, she's our queen in the Caribbean from Jamaica. Kofi, who was a self-declared general. And they're legends. I of, mean, of course. You, you from can't read this about, region, yes, you can't read he about, was Akan. about history mm -hmm. and um, the, the revolts that took place within slave colonies without hearing about Queen Nanny or reading about, uh, about Kofi, you can't. Right. I mean, Europeans call him Kofi, so to my compatriots, you know, it came Kofi. down as Kofi, but of course, on this sacred ground, I cannot say Kofi. Oh. I must dignify him yes. with his name. Kofi, Kofi, born on a Friday. Right. So, Kofi, our general, our national hero, I am indebted to them, and they always resisted fought for freedom, fought for human rights, even when they were given the status of chattel. And I'm grateful to them because I, they laid down their lives so that I do not have to be cutting cane or right. a house slave on a plantation. So, you know, we have um, two very interesting, uh, um, should I say, points of reference between the two of us for freedom and emancipation because on the one hand we've spoken about how you grew up in a free village we've spoken about prince kofi we've spoken about queen nanny the freedom fighters of the slave colonies but then we also have freedom fighters who gave african countries like ghana independence you know from the colonizers some may argue that yes a lot of development that we experience today came from colonization but there are a lot of remnants of that that we're living with now we weren't colonized by our own will. It was almost as though it was a way of, okay, so if we can't have you as slaves, we're gonna move in and then we'll rule you because you don't know how to rule yourselves. There's a lot of breaking down of systems and I mentioned Kwame Nkrumah and the James Fort, but behind us there's also the lighthouse, you know? And I mean, there are lots of vestiges, lots of vestiges. So we, we owe it to our ancestors and to the people who came before us in so many ways, but I just thought I wanted to point that out, that I should point it out, that there's a freedom emancipation from slavery, but there's also the emancipation from colonization. And we're still finding our way from both. But somehow, finding our way has brought people like us together. Yes, <laughs> and it's wonderful. And I, I'm really, you know, speaking of finding our way, I'm glad we found our way to a point where, and I take my hat off to the government and people of Ghana, to the point where we recognize that we have family. 
that we have mutual ancestors. And so I am privileged and blessed to be one of the earliest Caribbean nationals to arrive in Ghana without a visa. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you have no idea how pleased I was that is brilliant. in deciding, you know, doing my planning and organization for the trip. And when I started researching, I said, oh, but removal of visa restrictions. And I called people I knew and they said, it hasn't happened yet. And so I got a friend of, of mine, a compa I believe he's a mutual uh, contact. And I, I had him calling people at the mission and calling foreign affairs. And everywhere the response came back no visa required and i tell you i felt like a bosses i felt like a bosses not because i'm coming here to control anybody or to give orders but because i felt like the ruler of my own destiny Absolutely. i can come here of my own accord and feel welcome without anyone's permission yeah. stamped in my passport. But, but Jennifer, I think this is something that I need to draw our viewers' attention to. So in 2019, when we celebrated right here in Ghana, the year of return, which marked 400 years um, post the, the, you know, the, the, the slave trade, right? Um, I mean, that was a huge deal. And for the first time, so many brothers and sisters of the diaspora were coming home. Since then, we have the Diaspora Africa Forum with our own ambassador, Doctor, Her Excellency Dr. Erica Bennett. I mean, so many interesting things have happened. But when the president declared, and he, and he did it in Jamaica, now look, you don't need visas from the Caribbean yeah, to come five, to Ghana. Five, five yes, Caribbean right? nationals. A lot of people thought it would never happen. So here is Madam Jennifer Branch from Guyana works with the UN headquarters in a very high office oh. and she's still though we have to and she's telling us that look she came to Ghana without a visa I am um, you know your excellency Nane Pufuado doff my hat off to you sir yep. because that is the beginning of, of our true emancipation of normalization yes. of the family yes. our, our, because, true, our uh, true emancipation five, five Caribbean five Caribbean uh, countries nations their nationals are have no longer okay, to be subject okay, so to which countries these, are these? Uh, Trinidad and Trinidad Tobago, Tobago, my neighbor to the north, my closest neighbor in the Caricom region. Well, it's actually maybe if I say it this way, from Jamaica to Guyana, okay. and in between Barbados. Okay, so Jamaica, Guyana, Barbados. Trinidad and Tobago, Tobago St. Vincent and Saint the Grenadines. So these five Caricom countries no longer. No the, longer. The, 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 the country we called the, the Carib, the Caribbean, our yes, home. That is home. brilliant. Jennifer, I mean, we're going to continue this conversation. Ladies and gentlemen who are watching us today, thank you so much for tuning in. But as you can tell, there's still so much to talk about, still so much history to learn, and still so much to discover about Jennifer herself and what she does, because I know a lot of you are curious, like, can you already tell us how she got to the UN from Guyana? Because we need to know, we want to go there too maybe someday and, and rule our own destiny. So we will continue the conversation. So I will, with my producer's permission and my director's permission, I will Christian this, the first part of a two-part series where we're spending time with our sister, Jennifer Branch, who is once again a senior legal officer at the UN headquarters in New York. And she's Guyanese, more importantly, and she's here in Ghana. And as she spends her last day in Ghana, we get to bring her to you, viewers of Diplomatic License. My name is Apioko, and so next week, Jennifer and I will be back and then you get to peek into all that we're doing here in Accra before Jennifer heads off back to her day job. <laughs> this has been another exciting episode of Diplomatic License. Do stay tuned to City TV and of course do use the hashtag Diplomatic License to stay in touch with us and follow all the conversations and everything that's happening with the show. See you next week. <laughs>